see you on this beautiful fall morning. It's getting crisp. You can tell it's turning to fall, that's for sure. Uh, if there's any visitors, uh, we'll get you a uh, card if you'd like to fill it out and put it in the put it in the plate as you leave, just to have a record of your being here and uh, maybe keep in contact with you. Uh, let's see, it's going to be a wonderful morning. Mr. Ball's going to be submerged this morning for the baptism. It's always a wonderful feeling for the church and uh, for the individual too. Uh, is there any uh, more uh, announcements anybody would like to make? Let's go to the Lord in prayer then. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful, blessed fall day. And thank you for all the blessings you bestow on us each and every day. Because all blessings come from you, dear Lord. And we, you are so gracious to bestow them upon us. Be the ones that they are sick, traveling, any situation that they're in. Let them feel your presence, dear Lord, knowing that you would get them through whatever they are facing. Dear Lord, thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Without him and forgiving our sins, we would not be able to do the glorious things that we can do in his name throughout the years that we serve. Dear Lord, be a Pastor Tim today as he brings our message. Let us open up our spiritual minds, ears, and hearts to receive that message and uh, spread it into the community, dear Lord. Dear Lord, uh, thank you for all that you do for us. I'll uh, always let us turn to you when we are in need. Dear Lord, so uh, thank you for all that you do for us, dear Lord. In your sense, gracious and heavenly body, we say, Amen. continue to 
see more ways that you bring us blessings and encouragement. Lord, we do come to you with many concerns upon our hearts. We think about those who are having medical procedures done this week, and we want to ask, Lord, that you would guide the doctors and that you would keep these folks safe. Be with their families as they wait. And we also pray, Lord, for those that are going through treatments, that those treatments might work, and that those treatments would bring them back to full health. And Lord, we pray for those that maybe have other physical issues, other mental issues, emotional issues, financial issues, whatever it might be. We pray, Lord, that you would work in them also. That you would guide and help and direct. And Lord, we know that there are many concerns around this world where people don't feel heard, where people are not sure what it means to follow you. So we pray, Lord, that you would open doors and avenues and ways for people to experience you, to know you, and to come to Jesus Christ to make him their Savior and their Lord. Lord, what a blessing it is to know you and to walk with you. Guide us now through this time as we experience baptism once again. As we think back on our own baptism, help us that we might remake our commitment to walk in your ways and to be your person in this world. Guide us now as we use Jesus' words, words that he taught to his disciples when they said, teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. baptism of Alan today, I will cause you to think back on your baptism. To think back how God was there to guide you ever closer in the walk and walking with Jesus Christ. That you will remember the commitment you made when you came to Christ and accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. For me, baptism is a profession of faith for the person who comes, but it's also a commitment by the congregation to this individual. So during this baptism, there will be a part up on the screen. I'll read the first part, and then you will respond, because we are making a commitment along with Adam to walk with him, to help him, to guide him, and also to listen through him as God speaks through Alan to us. So remember back to your baptism, but then also remember today is a new commitment to help Alan as he continues to walk this spiritual path. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. And lo, I am with you, even to the end of the age. Today I'm happy to present to you Alan Ball as he comes for membership and baptism into the body of Jesus Christ here at Bithville Baptist Church. Alan? Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I do believe in him. 
as my Lord and Savior. It's then in the great command of Jesus Christ that I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.
I'll get it yet. If not, Jerry's going to come up and untie me after I finish tying all the knots in it. Okay. I was going to tell you, Jerry, keep singing because I, I got to work on the sermon. I ain't got it yet. Um, what a blessing it is to experience baptism. Amen. What a blessing it is to see it again and again and again. Before I read the scripture today, there's one thing I want to share with you that God's really been touching my heart on as I've been slowly reading through the book of Galatians uh, for my uh, devotion time in the mornings. I probably read three or four verses a day and that's about it. But God has shown me in unbelievable ways <clears throat> that what God has promised to me is the same promise that goes all the way back to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. God's word came that it might help people to live in the midst of the promise that was given to Abraham. And people were under the law, so to speak, as Paul phrases it. But they were under the law as a kind of a custodianship. It was a difficult one. And Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for our sins so that God could keep the promise that God made to Abraham. So that we could participate in that promise. A promise that comes to God and says, I still want you as part of my kingdom. That's incredible. Do you realize how many thousands of years it's been? And God says, even though it's been thousands of years, I still want to fully keep my promise to Abraham. That's what the spiritual life's actually about. Living in the midst of that promise. Today's sermon talks about how we mess up that promise. How we destroy that promise. As I read these words from Mark, the ninth chapter, I want to mention one thing before I read this. In the NIV, and in most modern translations, there is no verse 44 and verse 46. In older translations, there is, and it's a repeat of what verse 48 is. So there's not anything missing from this, okay? the most reliable manuscripts that they have found in the, in the past years do not have verse 44 and 40, 46 in them. So if you're looking at a tra more modern translation, you'll just see that it has verse 44 and then it skips right to verse 45. And then it skips 46 right to verse 47. Just know that in the manuscripts that have that, what is there is the exact same thing that's in verse 48. Okay? So nothing's missing. It just appears as though, as scholars think, that somewhere down the line, some scribe thought that it would be good to add that refrain as verse 44 and verse 46. Okay? So listen to these words. These are Jesus' words. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, 
It would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two hands and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of heaven with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. This passage is all about sin. And how Jesus wants to understand, wants us to understand the seriousness of sin. Sin is serious. When sin exists in our lives, it is serious, and there are no minor sins. There are no minor sins. There's no sins that would be classified as misdemeanors. There's no sins that like, oh, well, that's okay. Sin is sin. There's no minor sins. I know in our minds that we grade those sins. And if somebody commits this sin, whatever it might be, they're much worse than I am. Just because I told a white lie. Folks, I just want you to understand a white lie is a lie, is a sin. And the other one that we don't think about often that I'm just going to address is gossip. That's sin. That is flat out sin. If you're talking about someone else in order to judge them, in order to put them in a place, in order to say something about them that's not good, that's sin. It's as simple as that. And that sin condemns you to hell just as much as murdering someone. Because Jesus even says in the Sermon on the Mount, if you talk about someone else, it is the same as killing them. Maybe in our day and age, we would call it character assassination. But even as we call it that, listen to the word assassination, that's murder. Sin is sin. There is no way around that, and I want you to understand that. Whether it's the sin of stealing a pen from work, it's a sin. And the reason that Jesus is so serious about this is because of this. Any sin separates us from God and will also harm others. Any sin separates us from God. Scripture speaks about that time and time again that there is a division between us and God because we sin. Have you ever wondered why Jesus hangs on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, Jesus didn't sin. He had perfect communion and relationship with God throughout his whole life. And at that moment on the cross, our sins were placed on Jesus Christ. 
And he bore those sins. And at that moment, it destroyed Jesus' relationship with God. So that when he looked up to see God, he could not. Because the sin separated him from God. And that's why he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is now bearing our sins on the cross. And it destroys his relationship with his heavenly father. It's also a guarantee that sin is going to harm other people. I know, some people think they have secret sins that nobody knows about. And they don't harm anybody else, and it's okay for me to participate just, just this kind of little bit. It's okay, it doesn't harm anybody else. Yes, it does. It harms how you think. It harms how you act. And some of our sins have consequences that cause massive problems for other people. I'll just mention one. Someone who is a drunk driver and runs into another vehicle and kills people in the other vehicle. Their sin affected people that had nothing to do with that man's sin. I can't stand here and so tell you that's what God wanted for that family to die at that moment. I can't do that. That's not true. That's not scriptural. That's not God's will. It happened because somebody sinned. And sin has an effect on this world. You see, sin destroys our relationship with God and it keeps it from growing. It destroys our relationship with God. And it makes it almost it makes it impossible to grow in that relationship with God. Impossible. Because scripture says God cannot look upon sin. And when we are covered in sin, what does God see but sin, not us? And God says, no. No. I will not have a relationship with you. And this loving relationship will not grow. Now, I also want you to understand this. It does not mean that God doesn't still love you. Those of you who raise children, sometimes they did things that weren't the most intelligent things to do. And you got very upset by it. But did you stop loving them? Did you stop helping them? When we sin, God still loves us. But God does want to hear us come and say, God, forgive me, for I have sinned. God wants to hear, as David says in Psalm 51, create in me a new heart, a pure heart. When you have sin, that's one psalm that I would go to. Because that's David's prayer to God after he has been caught breaking half of the Ten Commandments in one action. And he comes to God and says, God, forgive me. God created me a pure and a new heart. Forgiveness is not, or re confession and repentance is not just a feeling. Oh, I feel sorry about what I did. Lord, I have sinned, and I want to change that. And I want to walk in a different direction. And I don't want to walk the same way anymore because I want my relationship with you to grow. 
and not be destroyed. Now many people have had problems with this passage because Jesus uses exaggerated statements to show us how important it is to deal with sin. Jesus uses exaggerated statements. Does Jesus want us to cut off our hands? No. Does Jesus want us to cut off our feet? No. Does Jesus want us to gouge out our eyes? I remember one time I was talking with some folks and they asked me if I believed in the literal interpretation of Scripture. And I said no. Because I've never found any Christians that have their hands cut off or their feet cut off or their eyes gouged out. And when I do, I might consider that there's a literal interpretation of all Scripture. In this case, Jesus is not trying to be literal. He's trying to expound upon this and exaggerate it in such a way to say, look how serious this is. You must deal with sin. You must. Any little sin in your life destroys your relationship with God, no matter what it is. Any sin. And Jesus said it is very important that you deal with it. And let me tell you how serious this is. It would be better for you to go to heaven missing a hand, a foot, or an eye than to completely fail to sin and go to hell. Do you understand how serious that is? Jesus is making that? He said, I don't want you to cut off your hand or your foot or gouge out your eye. You see, these statements are not meant to be literal, nor are they meant to be ignored. Sometimes when we hear exaggerated statements like this, we just kind of ignore them. Well, that doesn't include me. I, I, haven't, I haven't broken one of the Ten Commandments. That doesn't include me. We don't take the exaggeration for what it really is. Jesus is saying this is serious. This is important. And here's how serious and how important it is. And a matter of fact, as he says these words, they have an example right before them that helps them to see what's going on. As he speaks these words, right outside of Jerusalem is a trash dump. It is a trash dump because this area has been defiled. Previous kings of Israel had sacrificed their children to the god Moloch in that very valley. And that place became a trash dump because of it. Did you hear what I said? Kings of Israel, not foreign nations, kings of Israel did this. Now, in Jesus' day, there is a trash dump there. And in this trash dump, the fires are always burning. The worms are always eating the trash. So as Jesus speaks these words, they can look right over to this valley and see what he's talking about. There actually are very few times that Jesus ever uses the word hell or place of the dead. Quite often he says Gehenna is the word that he uses. And when they hear Gehenna, they think about the trash dump which is in the valley of Gehenna. 
There's an example right before them. He says, you guys experience this in your own day and age that those fires never go out and that the worm is always there eating. And if you want to play with sin and not deal with sin in your life, that's what's going to happen to you. Sometimes it's very easy to know if something's a sin. Because it's all about I. What I want. What I desire. And if I'm getting what I want and what I desire by stepping on other people, oh, guaranteed sin right there. Why do we gossip about folks? Because we're putting them down so we look better. Think about that. That's why we talk about other folks sometimes. In bad and negative ways. Because we want people to see them worse than we are. That's sin. That's not building somebody up. That's not helping somebody. Don't ignore these statements. Jesus says sin is serious. Don't ignore them. Because at the very end, he says salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? And for us in our day and age, we go, well, salt never loses it. Salt doesn't go bad. It doesn't lose its saltiness. If it gets impurities in it, it does. If it gets other things in the midst of it that's not salt, it loses its saltiness. And Jesus is saying, if you allow sin to creep into your life, no longer will you be salty enough to preserve this world. No longer. Now, I do want to make sure that I say this, though. God loves you. God cares about you. God doesn't want you to have to deal with sin. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you, but as is common to man. And God is faithful and will give you a way to escape. Do you hear that? God says that when the temptation comes to fall to sin, God has already opened the door for you to walk away from it. Now it's your choice. God also says in 1 Corinthians, or not 1 Corinthians, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Paul in some of his letters talks about when you get up, I want you to be clothed with Christ. When you get up in the morning, I want you to put Christ on. Especially in the uh, book of Ephesians where he talks about putting on the full armor of God. The breastplate of righteousness. The belt of truth. Feet shod, feet shod with readiness to preach the gospel. Are you getting up in the morning and putting on what God has supplied for you so that when temptation comes, you can see that door and walk away from a possible sin? God loves you so much that God says, I have provided a way for you to escape. I love the passage in the book of Exodus. I believe it's Exodus chapter 18. Somebody can check me on that later and let me know. But they're standing on the very edge of the Red Sea. And behind them is the very Spirit of God that's keeping the Egyptian army away from them. And the people are fearful. And Moses parts the water. And the people are fearful. And what does Moses tell them? 
Do not worry. The enemy you see today, you will see no longer. That's the very message that Jesus Christ wants us to understand. If we will come to him and accept him as our Lord and our Savior, we have forgiveness of sins. God has mercy and grace. Grace is giving us things we don't deserve. And mercy is not giving us the things we do deserve. God loves you. And I want to make sure that you understand that no matter what happens, you cannot change God's love for you. Never. No matter how many times you've failed, no matter how many times you recognize sin in your life and you say, oh, no big deal. You cannot change God's love for you. Can't do it. That is impossible. I want to ask you this, though. Since Jesus says that sin is so important, whether it be that little thing that we think is much of nothing, or whether it be what we call a major sin, by the way, remember, none of the, the, there's no distinction in the Bible. Sin is sin. Is there a sin that you need to deal with in your life? so your relationship with God can grow. Is there a sin that you need to deal with so that your relationship with God can grow? Maybe you need to make a commitment today. Maybe you realize there is something in your life that you need to deal with. So that your relationship with God can grow. God wants that more than anything. I know I've talked pretty hard about sin today. But don't forget, God just wants you to come and say, God, I'm sorry. And I will change. Maybe today you need to make that decision. No matter how long you've walked with God, I wish there was something we could do that we didn't have to deal with sin anymore. I found out studying the Bible for over 25 years, I still deal with sin. You would think I would see every trap that Satan sets in front of me. it still happens and sometimes I have to go to God and God's I'm sorry forgive me and help me to change how about you I'll be here to receive anybody that needs to come for membership in the church for accepting Jesus Christ as their savior for just coming and saying pastor will you pray with me and ask God to help me deal with this problem in my life. As Rhonda pray, as we go to God and talk to God about what you need to right now.
going to ask Alan to uh, join me up front here, please. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to share with you what a joy it has been to spend some time with Alan this week, talking with him, laughing with him, uh, spending time talking about this week just how we were going to do the mechanics of baptism. Uh, and what a joy that's been to spend some time with you and talk with you about those things. And I know that God's working in your life. And I know that God is leading and guiding you ever deeper. Uh, the candle that Alan, those of you that have not been baptized by me, the candle that Alan walked out of the baptismal with is his to keep. So that he can remember that God wants him to be the light of this world. But also, we have a certificate uh, that certifies that Alan D. Ball was baptized in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit on the 26th of September at Whitfield Baptist Church. And I've also printed out for him what, what I said. Because I realize my baptism was done as an adult in the early 90s. And I'm going to tell you, even right afterwards, I don't remember what the pastor said. Because I was busy thinking about where am I supposed to stand? How am I supposed to grab his arm? Which direction am I supposed to be looking? What am I supposed to say? When do I say it? So, Alan, you, you have a copy of what I said today so that you can spend some time. I would encourage you to take some time to get to know Alan better and his wife, Diane. Um, folks, this is what it's about. Amen. It's about being community and fellowship together Amen. and knowing each other more deeply so that we can walk and be the people that God wants us to be. Let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, what a blessing it is to see someone come to be baptized. And Lord, how that helps us to think back to our own baptisms and the commitment that we made. But what a blessing it is also to make a commitment with Alan to say that I'm going to walk with you and that I'm going to listen as God speaks through you. Lord, may we always support Alan in his walk with Jesus Christ. And we, may we be there for every moment of need that he has, whether it's just to sit and listen and say, brother, I don't know where you're walking. And I've never been this path before. But if you let me, I'll walk it with you. Because Lord, that's what you want us to do. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Go and walk in the new